My name's Elijah and welcome to my podcast, Songwriting for Songwriters. My guest today is Mark Davidson. Mark is a songwriter, a musicologist, and he's also the lead archivist at the Bob Dylan Centre. They've just released a new book called Mixing Up the Medicine, which is uh, getting a rave reviews all across the place. And it has a career spanning look at all the stuff in Bob Dylan's archives. So I speak to Mark about uh, how they created that book, Mark's own work as a songwriter, and much, much more about uh, Dylan and everything else in between. So please check it out and subscribe. Thank you. Joining me today on my podcast, Songwriting for Songwriters, is Mark Davidson. Hi, Mark. How are you? I'm doing great. It's great to see you, Elijah. Thank you, mate. So, um, as you may or may not know, this podcast is all about songwriting. And um, you are a songwriter yourself, a musicologist, and also lead archivist at the Bob Dylan Center. Is that um, correct? Yeah, I, I, my, my title is Senior Director of Archives and Exhibitions uh, for American Song Archives, which is the Woody Guthrie Center and Bob Dylan Centers in Tulsa, Oklahoma. That's got to be one of the best job descriptions of all time, right? <laughs> I'm a very lucky guy. That's great. And you've just released a book from the center, Mixing, Mixing Up the Medicine, which is, I mean, the feedback and reviews are amazing. There's like Bob Dylan hardcore fans that are going nuts for it. It's got great reviews in New York Times and all over the place. So I'd like to talk about that with you for a bit as well. But first of all, first and foremost, how do you end up with that job? What's your journey been from, you know, getting into music to uh, being lead uh, of the Bob Dylan Center? Oh, gosh. Yeah, I it's it hasn't been a direct path. I uh, and I'll I'll try to keep it brief because otherwise we'll be here for two hours. But I, you know, I picked up a guitar at age 14, 15, uh, was in choir, show choir. There there are pictures of me and uh, gold lame vest and long grungy hair in the, the 90s. Um, and I just followed music from there. I ended up going to uh, college for uh, first for studying voice and opera. Uh, yeah. Didn't like that. Picked up classical guitar. Um, started studying music history and literature at. Uh, I finished up at Florida State University in Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, there I started playing. Well, I had been playing in bands, but I I played in uh, a couple of bands uh there um one was a kind of shoegaze ethereal kind of goth band called mira m-i-r-a uh we had three albums out on project records and i also made a record with a, a band called welcome to nagalands uh which was recorded by steve albini up in chicago <clears throat> where where i grew up um that album never uh, came out, but uh, a couple of the members went on to play with Iron and Wine, uh, yeah. really uh, amazing uh, uh, group led by Sam Beam. And then uh, from there, I ended up at uh, University of California, Santa Cruz to do a PhD in musicology. And that was right around the time of the financial crisis. And I was thinking about jobs and I had been and I ended up at University of Texas at Austin to do a degree in archives and library science. And the job, the Dylan librarian job, as it was at that moment, uh, came up while I was on the academic job market and figuring out what to do. And it just felt like a, an amazing opportunity. And here I am now. Wow, that's uh, quite, a, quite a journey, actually. What was it like working with Steve Albini? It, Albini or Albani? Uh, Albini. It was like summer camp. It was it was amazing. We, uh, I think, right before us. So we. This was December of two thousand, uh, late December, right after Christmas. I think Neurosis had just been in recording a record, and a band called Technician was right after us, and we spent a week recording. Uh, an album there in I think it's called Studio B and we stayed on site uh, at that point there were 
dormitories, uh, little rooms that you could stay in. And uh, it was one of the most amazing experiences of, of my life to that point. We all saved up our money and, and I had just graduated college. So I had a little uh, uh, graduation money and I put it towards making this record. And he couldn't have been more gracious and professional and understanding that we were a young band making our first record. He taught us how to play three cushion billiards. Um, <clears throat> we, yeah, just had a, a really, really amazing time. The, the record sounds incredible and uh, uh, it's, it's never come out, but, um, uh, but it, it's something I can put under my pillow at night and uh, listen back to. So. Yeah. Nice. <clears throat> he does come across as a very uh, gracious chap, actually. I think there was a documentary with, I think it was Dave Grohl, Sound City, I think, where they were talking to him. Um, but what I liked, there's a lot of producers who take percentages of big records, but he was speaking about how he does the job with whatever band come in. He's an engineer, he does the job. And he just seemed to be very down to earth about his uh, role in some big records, you know. Yeah, he he approaches it it's a a job he has a particular set of skills i i sound like i'm quoting a uh liam neeson movie but uh he's he's very good at getting things to sound great and he he approaches it he, he transparently and not from the standpoint of you know i'm this big producer who's worked with you know yeah. these big names and you know you are gonna get the record i make it's it's really just a document of the band in the moment in that performance and uh there there was one moment where we had a very kind of long song with a <clears throat> lot of parts which was very typical in the late 90s um uh blowing up song form and and writing things that were epically long lots of transitions and uh <clears throat> it was a fast part at at the end uh sort of uh motoric kind of can noy kind of you know post-rock part and uh i was so excited in the recording that i ended up um uh and so kind of exhausted by the end that i ended up uh falling um on i was a bass player uh, in that band and you can hear it at the end of the recording. So it was, it was, it, it's kind of fun for me to listen to because I can hear that moment uh, and that excitement in that moment. And yeah, it's like, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of like looking back at photographs of yourself. Yeah, sure. Fantastic. What an experience. Um, so you've just released mixing up the medicine um, sort of, compiled and written by yourself and your friend Parker Fisher is that right yeah uh, Parker Fisher it, it's tell me about how that came to be because obviously working at the Bob Dylan Center and Willie Guffey Center is a big thing in itself but did you conceive of that idea like tell us how that came into how it was first of all kind of dreamt up yeah ab absolutely so I was hired for the job. And at that time, the curator of the Bob Dylan archive was a fellow named Michael Chaikin, who uh, had been working in archives and uh, with a, a particular emphasis on film. Um, he had worked on the Don't Look Back Criterion Collection Edition. Uh, he continues to work in film and just a very well connected. Uh, uh, inspired and inspiring person. And he and his, his colleague, Robert Polito, who was a, a poet and a professor at the new school in New York city, uh, they started bringing people down. The archive came to Tulsa in 2016. And shortly thereafter, they started bringing all of these people down uh, to Tulsa to check out the archive and to do a public program. So, Lucy Sant and Richard Hell and Lee Ronaldo and Larry Ratso Sloman, Amanda Petrosich, uh, trying to think just so many, uh, Gregory Pardlow, the poet, uh, 
so many amazing people. And they had conceived of this book of, of essays, sort of a modest, you know, 50 or so essays, short essays by people of John Doe uh, of, of X was, was one of those people. Um, and the people would come in, look at the archive, find something they were interested in, uh, choose an item and then write an essay about it. And we were going to have the essays and the uh, artifacts from the, the archive manuscripts uh, and the like. And, <clears throat> and then we ended up uh, trying to find a publisher and we came across Callaway uh, Arts and Entertainment, Callaway Books, who had for decades done these big, massive kind of impressive art books and we partnered up with them and uh, the project went from a sort of small volume of essays to a, a huge career spanning uh, kind of magnum opus um, mm -hmm. about Bob Dylan. And, and then we had a pandemic. And so the, the last person we had out uh, was Lucy Sant and uh she was doing a, a a reading at a little dive bar in Tulsa called the Cellar Dweller. And I remember that weekend distinctly because uh, we had just found out that South by Southwest had been canceled. It was March of 2020. Yeah. And I had just moved up from Austin and I knew what a big deal that was. What a major decision that had to be for yeah. the city of Austin, where so much of its revenue, so many people I knew in Austin relied on South by Southwest to, you know, stay afloat financially. And, and we knew something was coming. Uh, and it was, it was very, very eerie. Uh, so <clears throat> during the pandemic, uh, we started working on building, uh, designing, curating the Bob Dylan Center. Um, and that opened in May of 2022 in, in Tulsa. It was fantastic. We had a great VIP weekend. We had in a row, uh, Mavis Staples one night, Patti Smith the next night, and then Elvis Costello the night after that. It was a, a, a incredible weekend in Tulsa. Um, and then we got back to working on the book. And by that point, uh, Michael, and Robert had had moved on uh, uh, to other projects. So uh, Parker Fischel and I ended up uh, picking up the the book and, and running with it. And so it came together really quickly. And uh, and now it's out in the world. And it's 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 really amazing that uh, we were able to, I don't know, uh, you know, through a pandemic and and kind of against all odds, uh, come up with something that is uh, so massive and kind of uh, overwhelming and 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 hard to hard to fathom. Yeah, that's. <clears throat> I think often sometimes people forget that you know there's the stars themselves, whether it's a kind of uh, artist or what a book's about, but the team behind the scenes pulling something together like that is massive, isn't it? It's such a big commitment and uh, takes a lot of energy to 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 sail that ship home yeah yeah it it was probably the most difficult thing that i have worked on in terms of timeline and the amount of content and curation that went into it um i include my 877 page dissertation in that uh and also the designing and building of a museum during the pandemic, but the, the book was its own special kind of uh, uh, intensity, I think is, yeah. is the right word for it. So did, um, was, was that put to Bob Dylan as like something that um, you guys wanted to create or was that, does he have to approve that or is that a separate kind of um, decision? Yeah, we work, work very closely with, uh, with Dylan's management office and, and certainly it, it was approved and, and authorized, uh, to be done. I, you know, I've said on, on a number of occasions, I, I don't know that I will ever meet Bob Dylan in my lifetime. Um, 
uh, that's not a, a, a challenge to, to Bob to seek out to meet me at all. Um, but it, you know, he, he's working on, you know, he's, he's touring right now. He's 82. He's, he's constantly doing new things. Um, so, but, but I, he, I, I know that, that he's involved in, you know, everything that happens in, 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 you know, his world and career. So, uh, but uh, as, as for whether, uh, uh, he will ever look at the book, I, I would feel uncomfortable <clears throat> being the nobody I am having a museum dedicated to me or, uh, <laughs> you know, a, a, a book of, of all the stuff I had collected over the years. So, um, uh, that, that, that I understand as well. So the book's made up of these essays, but it's also made up of photographs of, uh, I'm guessing lyrics and uh, also some letters from, uh, I noticed from McCartney and Harrison and different people. So give us an idea of like the kind of, uh, outside of the essays, what we have in this, uh, fascinating collection. Yeah. So the, the book is a, career spanning up until I think it was spring of of this year of 2023 we were adding in new details to to the the Dylan story I think it went up through about the release of of Shadow Kingdom and some of the live shows that he had been doing but we start at the beginning and there are uh nine chapters sort of segments of Dylan's career based loosely on uh, what what we call the nine eras in the Bob Dylan Center. They're uh, 41 to 60, 61 to 64, 65 to 66, 67 to 73 or 74, depending on whether you're looking at the book or the center, and, and on and on. Um, what we were trying to get at with that was uh, it's, it's a very long career, and the one thing about Dylan is that he is not – you know, continue to do the same thing. It's, uh, he's constantly changing and shifting. And, uh, so yeah, it, it, the, the book essentially, uh, takes photos, lyric manuscripts, notebooks, correspondence to Bob, uh, uh, unused album cover artwork, uh, all, all kinds of things to try to tell the story of Dylan's life and career sort of through short, like the, we call it an inside out biography or it has been uh, termed that. And we've, we've sort of repeated that uh, where the, the object and the image is kind of the primary thing. And then we caption all, we tell the, the story off of, off of that. So if it's a chimes of freedom uh, manuscript, then we're talking about, you know, his trip across the United States and writing that in Toronto and uh, sort of how that manuscript fits in with uh, the rest of his writing style and uh, and types of writing. So, yeah, it's 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 a it's not a book that one needs to read cover to cover it. It sort of it, it doesn't demand it. It begs a bit or uh it allows one to just kind of open it up and you know yeah. find something they, they like to look at and find out more about it it's like that Kurt Cobain book that came out a while ago with his um diary entry so it's a fascinating way to get into the mind of an artist isn't it especially stuff that's unreleased a bit like the sketches of my sweetheart the drunk album by Buckley which you know it's that opportunity to get into an intimate space with the artist um as a songwriter and artist yourself what was that like for you to kind of gather this material from one of the kind of recognized world greats right um uh it's amazing you mentioned jeff buckley who's one of my one of my absolute favorites and has yeah. been for a long time and yeah. and there's a <clears throat> a brief uh dylan buckley related story of my own personal past um uh i i mean i they knew one another obviously but but uh divorce divorcing uh uh that um 
and, and, and focusing on my meager little life. Uh, I had a, a radio show uh, in Tallahassee uh, through the college radio station, WBFS. Um, and uh, there were two things. It was 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. Saturday night to Sunday morning. And uh, uh, two things that I would play almost every show when nobody was listening. And, and I love them because they uh, uh, were both really I, some of my favorite recordings in the history of recorded sound. And the first was uh, Dylan's poem, Last Thoughts on Woody Guthrie, which is uh, a seven minute spoken word performance of a poem he wrote uh, for Woody Guthrie at the April 1963 town hall show. And uh, the other was uh, uh, Buckley's cover of, of Kangaroo Song, mm. uh, which is an amazing, uh, I, it might be 19 minutes. I, it, it's in Agata De Vita length, um, but I would put those on and crawl out the window uh, at the radio station fourth floor and, and go look out over the Tallahassee skyline. Um, so anyhow, uh, nice. Uh, uh, just you, you, made me remember how much I love, uh, Jeff Buckley. Um, but your question was, uh, what was it like sort of yeah, as, as a kind of artist yourself, you know, because obviously you're creating your own work and have created your own work. I just wonder what the experience was. Obviously you were doing a job. Hey, to yeah. do it, but like as an artist and creator yourself, was there anything that you kind of gained or learn or kind of inspired you as a creator yourself looking through this kind of this, you know, treasure trope of uh, work. Yeah, no, it's, it's amazing. I, I'm amazed by how much is there, just how much documentation is there. Uh, all the lyric draft manuscripts and notebooks and <clears throat> I, something that we get at in the book a bit is there may be a random name, Rosemary Clooney, or, you know, uh, uh, people, a random name that, that Dylan jotted down as tech camera, um, uh, that seems kind of out of context, but then decades later, you know, he's writing about Rosemary Clooney or, uh, some of these pieces start to fit. Um, and, and there are instances all over of that. So it's, you know, it's kind of like any of us hearing something on the radio or somebody, you know, tells him about some group he needs to check out and he writes it down in his notebook. And um, that's pretty fascinating. Uh, but it's it's the work ethic that I think is the most amazing and inspiring because you'll have songs, you know, maybe like A Chime to Freedom, uh, not dark yet where you've got a single manuscript um but then there are songs like joker man or dignity joker man which has you know 17 or so uh uh pages of lyrics uh dignity which has more than 40 and you get a sense of of him really really banging away to get things right and editing and, and uh, really, really working on something. And in, in the case of Dignity, he did all that, recorded it, and then shelved it. And it didn't come out until Greatest Hits Volume 3. So I think, you know, from, from a songwriter, from my standpoint of things, and, um, and this isn't something I, I've gotten to talk about much on you know, any, any podcast interviews that I, I, I have, have done around the book, but, um, you know, when I moved to Tulsa, I, I had been, you know, seeing somebody in Austin. So I had kind of a long distance relationship and I had a lot of time on my hands here in a town where I, you know, middle aged and didn't really know anybody, but, uh, uh, in 2017, my band Mira did a one-off kind of reunion show, and and I I thought, well, maybe we'll make another record. And so, <clears throat> uh, 
and this does get interesting, I promise. Um, I started, I, I got a little, you know, universal audio, audio interface and a setup that I've got here and, and had been kind of a, amassing some instruments and, and I started recording just every day when I would get home from work, I, I, I'd come home, I'd take a nap, I'd have some coffee, I'd like bifurcate my day and and just work and just write. Didn't matter what it is. Um and I I amassed over the period of 18 months or so uh 400 to 600 songs. Um I, you know, I would spend entire weekends just getting up and making bits and or beats and writing songs and uh, and working on this stuff, some of which was total crap, but some of it was passable and some of it was good. And, and so it's the important part of that is for me was putting myself in that mind frame of creating and, 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 and without, you know, I, there, there was no question. I, 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 I had to work because I was compelled to work. But it also it opened up that part in my brain that allowed, you know, the unconscious brain where it starts to figure out, it starts to have better ideas, and then those ideas start to work on themselves in your brain when you're not working. But, uh, and then, and then better things come out, and I, it's it's sort of like anything else It's opening up that channel to, to that, that creativity. Um, and having that it's, it's drive and dedication and accountability to doing it, but the, the dividends it's, you know, it, they, they really pay off. Um, a quick, a quick other aside to that is just yesterday. Um, I got a, a new classical guitar, uh, and I, you know, I studied classical guitar as an undergraduate, um, was never going to be a classical guitarist. I, I, there, there were folks who could do that really well. And I wasn't one of them, but I, I did, you know, work really hard at, at that. <clears throat> and, uh, there was a, there's a Bach fugue that I was learning, uh, an A minor, uh, I think it's BWV 1001 and uh it's not the most difficult piece but it's hard uh it's it's hard sort of mentally and, and focus wise and uh uh I so I got this this new classical guitar and 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 I'm very excited to see where I'm at with that piece in particular because throughout my life I've I've kind of gauged my own uh sort of physical ability to play uh the the mechanical aspect but also the mental mental health and sort of like focus and and peace and and all of those things through sort of how that that Bach fugue comes out in in my own you know like mm, nice. it, you know it's it, one of those things that that uh, for me, uh, it's, you know, it's like going back to your favorite place, you know, in your hometown, yeah. um, and seeing what it's like and, and kind of re-experiencing that. But the point is, um, all of that is, 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 you know, it's that dedicated, it, I don't wait for bolts of lightning anymore. I, uh, I, I kind of go for the, it's the, the mundane, mm. you know, uh, I, I'm doing this and I'm doing it every day. And, and yeah, that's yeah. where the, the great ideas come from. That's a really good take home, actually, from looking through that kind of work from Dylan, because you're right. There is like a kind of inspiration. And lots of people I speak to on this podcast, when they talk about the um, inspiration and muse, a lot of them do have that kind of moment of inspiration, but they are all working all the time, you know, listening out for things, trying things. So I think, you know, when you've got an artist who's got a career that long to take that away, the ded dedication and also what you said with the accountability as well, that's important. I think if you've signed up for being an artist or a songwriter, um, you know, without being too 
weird about it. I think I think you do have a, to hold yourself to account so that you are doing the work and you are releasing the work because otherwise it's just a bit of a pipe dream, isn't it? It's, and certainly he, and um, from what you're talking about there as well, is somebody who just has been at the coalface doing the work, right? So like a Neil Young, like a Dylan, if you do it every day or if you, you know, you're going to get some, some great stuff, but it's also fascinating to see what sometimes you don't release. You know, that's another... Thing, what you mentioned about this book is the album covers that weren't released um there's a great uh concert of neil young playing the massey hall and he's just written harvest and he's playing a man needs a maid and the words are different to what it is on the on the harvest album and i prefer the words on the massey hall version but it's great to get those insights into just you know behind before the presentation the moment the push before the fall you know that kind of moment is an interesting things so that sounds like it's quite the book's charged full of those kind of insights as well yeah the the that exactly that example um there there are so many songs in the dylan archive that never even got recorded um but with dylan and, and something we tried to do in the dylan center was you know you can throw up the lyrics to chimes of freedom or like a rolling stone or whatever and go wow th those are the lyrics to chimes of freedom or like a rolling stone but what what we were trying to do in those exhibits and and also in the book was to say well that's great but that is not even nearly the end point the the pen to paper part of it is a step in the process and and for Dylan, you know, I I I heard a story, and and I I'm sure it's not true, but um, uh, he he was working on this uh, series called Mondo Scripto, uh, which drawings and and lyrics, and uh, uh, in 2018, and um, Tangled Up in Blue, uh, I heard, and again, I I think this is uh, apocryphal, but uh he sent it in uh with new lyrics and 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 i heard he said oh i think i finally got it um you know like uh a song that he was working on in 1974 um and that's one of the songs that that we uh uh show off in the center really well and and in the book but uh there are these notebooks that uh we refer to as the blood notebooks and and there's one at the morgan library which is uh, pretty close to you know fair copy of of the lyrics but then we have in Tulsa two pocket sized notebooks where uh and and there are images in the book of it uh where he is writing microscopically it's uh and and furiously and you can tell that that this stuff is you know coming out very fast and and it's just you know uh one of the notebooks is almost completely full of all the songs from blood on the tracks and, and, you know, ideas from, uh, you know, separate songs are, are coming out sort of in kind of all in one kind of mind space. And uh, it's fascinating, but, you know, that's a song that, that he's continued to tinker with uh you know various versions of the recording and uh approaches to it and uh you know and there are you know some fascinating wonderful uh you know he he records it in new york he records it in minnesota and then he's you know messing with it on tour uh 1976 and then uh 84 78 like uh on and on and on so that's that's an instance where uh it is not finished once it hits the record in fact there are a lot of uh in the Dylan archive a lot of things where uh you know he's recorded the song the song goes off to uh somebody on 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 the staff to transcribe the lyrics uh, to go off to the copyright office and then he's changing the lyrics before you know before they're mailed out to the copyright office um which is uh yeah is is pretty incredible so do, is he still how do you get hold of this stuff do you just get like a sort of 
dumpy bag of stuff from Dylan's like uh, you know house every now and again. Is that how it works? I, it that's that's how it was how it was working. Yeah, um, we got the initial <clears throat> uh, sort of sale and donation that happened in 2015 that started coming uh, to Tulsa in 2016. Uh, there was another tranche of materials that came in 2017. Um, just recently, uh, the, the Dillon management office, which had been there in New York in the same, uh, building for decades, uh, uh, they, you know, after the pandemic, um, and they, you know, sold the music publishing to universal, uh, they had an office that they didn't, you know, need as much anymore. So they, they cleared that out. We got another, uh, big tranche of stuff, um, so yeah, it's it's really massive, uh, uh, and the, you know there are some fun things, um, you know fun things in the archive like uh, Dylan's wallet. It was one of the uh, earlier things that we got. Dylan's wallet from 1966, where it had a bunch of you know <laughs> scraps of paper and business cards in there, and um, uh. There were two scraps of paper with uh, Johnny Cash's address and phone number. Um, uh, there was a business card from Otis Redding, um, which coincides with, you know, Bob meeting Otis Redding uh, in spring of 1966 uh, at the Whiskey in, in Los Angeles, where uh, Bob offered him to do uh, Just Like a Woman. Um uh, but but Otis never uh, ended up recording it. Um, there's a business card from Annette Kuhlenberg, and on the back of it is uh, the uh, contact information for a photographer named Bjorn Larsen Ask. Uh, uh, Annette was a Swedish journalist, and Bjorn was a photographer on assignments, and uh, uh, Bjorn ended up taking, you know, 30 some roles over the course of a few days of Bob just walking around Sweden and, and Denmark. Um, and, and so, yeah, just these, these amazing little, like one wallet can hold so many stories. Yeah, it's, and it's, it's incredible it's, to think really that, you know, well, we've all got a wallet, right. But it's kind of like yeah. what you said, said earlier, when you've got a museum dedicated after you, these th if you, I suppose, if you're interesting enough, um, yeah, things become artifacts and clues and signposts and signals to, you know, the work or kind of where someone's at. It must, it's a fascinating thing to hear to hear you talk about it. You obviously know through your work, Dylan, in and out, um, because that's what you, you you're paid to do. But were you a big Dylan fan? Are you a Dylan fan? How, have you become a Dylan fan? What's your relationship with uh, his work? Yeah, my. My relate so when I was growing up, my first LP was the Monkey's Greatest Hits. Uh, awesome. That same Christmas, my brother got Sergeant Pepper's, um, and uh, uh, so Monkey's Beatles, and then uh, you know, I grew, I was born in '75, so um, uh, that was 1980. John Lennon had just died. Uh, and then I went on a bunch of different musical trajectories. It was, you know, Def Leppard and Quiet Riot and, and then, you know, Metallica Anthrax, DRI, like all of that, Dead Kennedys, like that kind of stuff. But I, I was always interested in music from the sixties and, uh, the Beatles were always kind of, you know, my, uh, high watermark, uh, you know, for, for music of that era, I, I loved, uh, the Beatles, I still do. And so I would, I would, anything I could get my hands on, I, I had a VHS copy of the complete Beatles, uh, documentary from the eighties that I, I memorized. Um, and there was another documentary, uh, that was on my local PBS station, W. TTW in Chicago, it was called, it was 20 years ago today. And it was a uh, retrospective, you know, uh, came out in 87 um, of uh, Sergeant Pepper and, and the sort of cultural stuff around it. And it had Abby Hoffman in it and uh, the musicologist Wilfred Mellers and, um, 
you know, members of the the diggers and the weather underground. And there were clips of Bob Dylan in that. Uh, there was a, uh, uh, some live 1966 footage, uh, of him doing uh ballad of a thin man. Um, uh, and, and there was also, uh, some clips of his, uh, one of his 1965 uh, California interviews, the the famous one where they say something like, do you consider yourself more of a, a songwriter or a poet? Or no, no, no. Uh, yeah, I, I might be blowing it. But um, and he responds, I I think of myself more as a song and dance man. Um, <laughs> and uh, and I was like, who's this guy? And and so I yeah, I I. I got freewheeling. I got bringing it all back home. I got another side. I got uh, Highway 61. And I listened to those to death. And then there was that moment where on V89 on WVFS, uh, I was a picture framer for a long time. And, and I was at the frame shop and somebody played Last Thoughts on Woody Guthrie. And that was that was like uh, that spoke to me in a way that um uh at that age at that moment in my life that i needed to and uh i uh, needed to hear and uh, so anyhow uh i but you know that's a, a very narrow sort of moment in dylan's career you know that's that's half of one decade of dylan's now you know seven decade career so uh when i when i came here to work i i like my knowledge of, of Dylan and his life and work kind of increased a thousandfold on a daily basis and uh, has only grown. Amazing. 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 So quickly ask another question outside Dylan. actually, what do you make of the new now and then Beatles track? Hmm. Um, I'll be honest. I've avoided it. Okay. I've avoided it because uh, uh, because I've had a lot of other things going on. Um, and, uh, you know, when the, the Peter Jackson uh, documentary came out uh, for, you know, Get Back Sessions, Let It Be, uh, I avoided that for a little while, too, um, because I didn't want... I wanted the time to take it in properly. Yeah. Uh, I didn't want to just, you know, jump in and uh, I don't know. There's something about that's, that's incredibly important about how I experience things. Yes, I agree. And, and the, the memory imprint of that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there, I remember a moment um, driving around the Florida coast uh, in a white VW bug, uh, listening to In the Airplane Over the Sea by Neutral Milk Hotel, and um, specifically that sort of uh, uh, instrumental dirge, um, uh, and and having like a memory implanted, you know, for the rest of my life with that. And um, uh, there are there are so many ways that music and memory works for me. So if I'm you know, chomping on dinner, you know, half paying attention on my couch, watching TV, uh, you know, I wouldn't have experienced the the Peter Jackson documentary. So I'm going to wait. The Peter Jackson documentary I actually uh, experienced when it was uh, either. Uh, so I live in Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, which has winter, but it doesn't we deal with winter in the same way that Chicagoans, where I'm from, deal with winter, where uh, there's snow removal and trucks and uh, all that. Um, so it was a, a kind of winter event here in Tulsa, and there might have been somebody with COVID as well. I don't remember exactly, but um, I was able to, to, you know, like do a, a full deep dive into into to get back totally on my own terms with no interruptions or or yeah, whatever that's, that's that's or uh, yeah that's what i want to do with now and then you make um, a good point there because I, I, I did dip in myself actually and, and i i did the opposite of what you did and i listened 
I, I had the thought, save this because you're going to get emotional, save it. And then mm. I rushed it and listened to it and on a, you know, just my phone in the car and then to, and then listened to it again afterwards, obviously, but I spoiled the moment. So I think he raised a good point. There is a time and a place to give yourself that space to really relish something. Yeah. Let me just, I, oh, sorry. Yeah. I, I, in, 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 you know, total honesty and transparency, um, I did, I did do exactly what you, uh, it might've even been on break at work on my phone. You know, I just clicked, you know, whatever link was on social media and I fast forwarded it to, you know, being able to hear the song. And my immediate thought was what a mess, what a <laughs> mess. And, and so I was like, I, no, I can't do that. No, uh, I, 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 I can't do that right now. Um, because sonically it just sounded strange to me and and that could have been a, a, any number of factors so um I'll, I'll give it its due yeah well I, I definitely one thing i did feel was oh there's john by my shoulder that was one of my first thoughts anyway let's um thanks for your time let me just ask you a couple of final questions if i may um and everybody's listening you go and get mixing up the medicine um it is a fascinating I'm going to get it. And it's a fascinating collection, as you've been hearing from Mark, and uh, a career just spanning um, archivists. Ar arch what's the word? A career spanning book of all Dylan's kind of uh, essays and Dylan's bits and pieces, um, scrap lyrics and all sorts. So it's a treasure trove of material. But a couple of final questions, one of which I ask every songwriter and one that I'm going to ask you specifically. Um, if you could be involved with someone else's archive on the music uh hall of fame who else would you like to kind of uh spend some time with looking through their stuff oh yeah um the the one i mean i don't know that we'll maybe that's what heaven is uh is uh a world where <laughs> uh the archives and collections of of all of the members of the beatles and their uh yeah. you know uh the the people surrounding them um i mean that would be uh that would be amazing but uh that you know that's just not <laughs> how the world works uh it, it would be massive too um i don't know they're yeah, it's it's a it's a great question. Um I love Nick Drake mm. and uh and 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 I I am appreciative of uh what his family has done in yeah. terms of you know putting out some of these archival books. Uh uh that is one because you know I got into Nick Drake and um probably 1994 it was just before the uh volkswagen pink moon commercial um uh the way to blue compilation that had come out uh there were two groups i mean two groups that i really liked at that moment sebado and uh a, a minnesotan group called walt mink and they both covered pink moon um and uh, radically different uh, approaches to to that cover, um, but I was like, I like these two bands a lot, and uh, and then I got the way to blue, and on the back, I think there's a, a Robert Smith of the Cure quote. Uh, Robert Smith is also uh, in the Cure, are also one of my absolute favorite groups. That would be a great archive, mm -hmm. um, uh, and 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 so yeah, I did the so but Nick Drake's life was so short and he was so sort of young. There's a new biography on him that's just come out uh, that is really incredible and kind of gets at, uh, you know, just what it, I, the, the, the story of Nick Drake that, that hasn't really gotten told. And uh, that is inspiring. I think uh, as a musician, um, mm -hmm. uh, sort of like how yeah it's 
that that's a masterclass in in sort of what it's like to be an ordinary person who's maybe a little bit removed from the world and trying to navigate the world uh, of music business, especially in the early 70s. Um, uh, anyhow, so Nick Drake, uh, The Cure, um, I don't know. Yeah, uh, uh, it's it's all these people that um, that I came to early on that I still have that sort of fanish fascination yeah. <clears throat> around. Fantastic. Well, those are good choices there. The Beatles, The Cure, and uh, Nick Drake are three very good choices. And you're, you are right, a uh, archive of Beatles uh, stuff and the people around them is literally heaven to me too. Yeah. So one final question, if you don't mind, Mark. If uh, This is a question I ask all songwriters. If you could have written um, someone else's song, if you'd been in, you know, if it was going around your head and, you, and, and it'd come from you, what song do you wish you could have written? One song. Um, uh, oh gosh, that's that's a difficult one. Um, it would be Strawberry Fields. Oh, good choice. Um, or or a day in the life. Um, mm. Or uh, Northern Sky or Three Hours by Nick Drake. Or. Uh, the entirety of disintegration or the entirety of, of in the airplane over the sea mm -hmm. uh, or loveless. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, yeah. I completely somehow left out my bloody Valentine. But, okay. Uh, but I'm going to push you for one, one song, just uh, of all those, song. Pick, pick one. I'll go with, strawberry fields because a day in the life is is not strictly a john song uh yeah okay so, yeah john fan um awesome yeah. mark thank you so much for your time and listeners do go and check out mixing up the medicine mark where else can people find your music or on uh, if you'd like to uh introduce us to your music is it out in the world yet can people find it yeah yeah the the mirror records uh m-i-r-a uh uh can be found on all of the streaming services um the welcome to nagaland stuff you have to do some deep searching on youtube and the like and you will come up with uh a couple of uh sort of bootleg youtube videos um uh which uh are in themselves a nice little scavenger hunt um so yeah brilliant thank you so much for your time mark thank you elijah this has been uh a total treat